Hello everyone, it's John Pollock alongside Cody Safdick. It's UFC 209 Fight Week, but it is also Bellator 174 Fight Week as they return to one of their favorite stomping grounds. Named in honor of the very first elimination on the first season of The Ultimate Fighter, Thackerville, Oklahoma. <laughs> yes, yes. Strange brew. Yes, straight. good times for the Bellator promotion in Thackerville, Oklahoma. So we're excited for the return and a decent little offering for Bellator. Yes, uh, we are going to be crowning Bellator's first women's featherweight champion because that is all the rage in MMA now, right now. Women's featherweight champions, whether they be, they be interim or in this case, uh, undisputed champion as Julia Budd will be taking on Marlus Kunin. Uh, with Marlus Kunin, we saw the loss to Alexis Dufresne last year. Very surprising outcome, uh, but in this particular fight, I mean, Julia Budd has a significant win streak coming into this into this fight. Do you see these as the two best women at 145 that Bellator has? Well, it's hard to say that the two best women uh, that Bellator has because of Alexis Dufresne, it was, it was pretty fairly He's fighting on the victory. undercard of this event. Yes, and that is shocking, but in many ways, you look at her two-run in the two-fight stint in the UFC and she fails to make weight in both of those fights. You look at that fight with Kunin, she misses by like some eight pounds. So mm -hmm. you can't even really call her a featherweight at this point. It's fun that you put that fight on the undercard of, of this event and it has a good little undercard as well. Guys like Justin Wren appearing as well, UFC veteran Cody Pfister. But you, you build up the, the division. Yeah, you build up the division. If she makes way, she has a good performance. Then you have your first challenger that you can bring into the mix. I like that they're doing this, uh, bringing in a featherweight division, following the UFC, bringing in a featherweight division. These are two of the highest ranked women in 145 pound MMA currently right now. So uh, it's a fight that makes sense. And also it, it shows that people are seems to be interested in women's martial arts right now. You can headline cards with that. We've seen with the UFC headlining a number of their recent cards with female fights. So I like it actually. Yeah, there's... The, the biggest criticism of the women's featherweight division has been depth, and I would argue there is depth. Unfortunately, it's spread over multiple organizations when you include Invicta and UFC with this Bellator division. I mean, you could cherry pick and make some really interesting fights. A Megan Anderson, for instance, who's the interim champion at this moment. No real fights for her at Invicta that jump off the page for you, but you look at just the depth issues, that's going to be the, the bigger struggle, I think, for any of these featherweight divisions to find their footing. Yeah, and it's very interesting as well because it would seem that the, the path would be go to Invicta, get a good win, win streak together, possibly win the title, and then move on to the UFC now that they've created their division. But Bellator does a fantastic job of luring this talent away, giving them a platform that they view as equal, if not better, for their current situation and their respective careers. So Bellator's done a good job of going out and signing some of this talent. And they jumped on this women's 145-pound division right off the bat. Scott Coker is obviously somebody that was interested in promoting women's MMA, and he has ties to people like Julia Butt and Marlouz Kunin, so it makes sense to bring them in. If Cyborg wasn't with the UFC, I could almost assure you that she would be signed to Bellator, but obviously she has that contract currently with, uh, with the Ultimate Fighter, or the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Um, but as I mentioned, it's not even just that division in particular. It's that Bellator is going out and signing these free agents and bolstering their card. And that's why normally on a, on a big weekend like UFC 209, you never really get any spotlight on Bellator events. And this is not even one of their big tentpole events, but still they're making that name for themselves by signing this talent, giving them a platform, and making fans interested in the product. We've also got on Friday night, uh, Fernando Gonzalez. He's taking on late replacement opponent, Brandon Gertz, who's coming up from 155 pounds to take this fight on relatively short notice, only a couple of weeks that he was notified of this. Uh, Brandon Gertz, last we saw him was against Adam Piccolotti, where he went the distance dropping a decision to Piccolotti, but that was after his second torn ACL in his right knee. And for any athlete, a torn ACL, it could be a career ender. So the fact he has come back from two of these I think is remarkable and when I spoke with him last week he almost viewed the the fight with Adam Piccolotti and his knee holding up as a moral victory because he'd been very tentative of how much to put on pressure on his knee because once you've had two tears uh, Cody that's going to be not just in the back of your head but the front as well yeah especially a guy that relies a lot on that speed and that athleticism that ability to just close that pocket take down guys or just land those big power punches Gertz is a guy that when he's at his best he's a threat to almost anybody at 155 pounds the issue is here is that now that you're talking about he has these knee issues he's taking a fight on short notice he's moving up to 170 pounds and the thing with Fernando Gonzalez not an impressive record an impressive fighter yep. this guy's as durable as anybody that competes for Bellator right now and and, and he's easy to write off because he doesn't have that name and as I mentioned he has a poor record someone's been fighting for over 10 years 13 losses to his name but you just look at a, a rundown of some of the guys that he's fought that he's competed with and even when he loses the guy took a kickboxing match against Paul Daly on the dynamite card had never fought pro kickboxing before went the distance with him didn't particularly look all that bad so you can't write off a guy like Fernando Gonzalez and even though it's not the most sexiest fight to fans so to speak this is a very well matched fight and I hope that Gertz at 170 pounds is as good as he is at 155 because this will surely make for an exciting bout. 
Do, do you sense at least a moderate momentum right now with Bellator? I feel that you know, every couple of months you do one of your big events, and for this particular year they had a real big one with Chael Sonnen and Tito Ortiz. Then just recently in San Jose, really out of their power, losing Matt Mitrio on the day of. But that was still the hype for that card was significant, I thought, for the main event. And my hope, or their hope at least, would be you can build up to one of those tentpole shows and then have a trickle-down effect to your cards like in Belfast last Friday and then this weekend as well in Thackerville. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You bring in the big names, guys, guys like Fedor Emelianenko and Matt Mitrione, and hopefully you can spotlight the other fighters on the card. But as well, they're in a very unique position right now where there's a lot of good free agents available. And if they have they the pocketbook to play... They could stack that light heavyweight division. The light heavyweight especially, and especially you look at, well, Ryan Bader's available, but Misha Cherkinov's available, and Nikita Krylov's talking about being available. And when you look at the UFC's division, it's not deep at all. If you can now create this division that has a champion like Phil Davis, that has named fighters, you can create that interest, then you have a, a huge opportunity to make some fans at least speculate, well, is the Bellator division just as good? And then when you look at other free agents always popping up, whether it's a guy like Lorenz Larkin, they just got to continue to field these offers. They're going to get the right pieces in place, and nothing's ever built overnight. Bellator is not going to surpass the UFC overnight. But for the first time in a very, very long time, John, it seems like there's an era of vulnerability to the UFC right now. And Bellator can most certainly capitalize on that. It's going to be something to watch. Friday's event, it goes down in Jason Thackerville, Oklahoma, as they will crown their first women's featherweight champion.